Warning, the video you're about to watch contains details of abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. In my video on Angelica Castillo, we talked about how some of these cases are very high profile, but with time, people still tend to forget. We've discussed justice in the form of DNA coming back to solve cases decades later. We've talked about people confessing to their heinous crimes. Now what happens when there's a confession, but there are two stories being told from two different parties that were involved. Justina Morales was missing for more than a year before anyone even noticed. In a case that truly displays negligence in blatant form, the suffering Justina went through in her final moments would give the city that familiar feeling. A feeling of hopelessness not being able to help, and anger because this happens way too often. On this episode of Evil Intentions, the story of Justina Morales. Justina Morales was born on February 19, 1987, in the Bed-Stuy section of Brooklyn, New York. She was born to mother Denise Solero. Justina was described as a happy and vibrant child. At only eight years old, her priorities were what they should be for any child her age, to be a kid, as shown here on Halloween of 1995, all smiles. As often is the case with some of these, the smiles on the child's face don't tell their full story. Beneath may lie suffering that even a grown adult would never be able to endure. For Justina, it was all of the above. A neighbor who lived next door to Justina stated that she was quiet and withdrawn. It was said that she was never close to any of the other kids and she was never a part of a group of children who would do things together. Sometimes she was seen sitting on the stairs by herself, although the rest of the kids were out playing. And while she shone here happy and smiling, she wouldn't live to see the new year. A hidden camera captures a babysitter abusing a toddler. Photographs show where these children were burned with cigarettes. A daycare worker leaves this child in scalding water for soiling her pants. Examples of Child abuse cases throughout the country in the 90s were all too common in the headlines. It's not much different these days, but some of these cases that shocked the nation were first of their kind. These were to be the cases that should have been the catalyst for some serious change. Decades later, for those who remember, the headlines and details of suffering that some of these children endure are just a cold reminder that we face the same problems we did decades ago. While some may see the signs that a kid is in danger and ignore them, that wasn't the case for a relative of Justina's. On November 29th of 1995, Justina's aunt, Sonia Solero, called the state central registry hotline to report that she suspected Justina was in some sort of danger since she just stopped coming to school. She hadn't seen or heard anything of the little girl. Out of the blue, the bubbly eight-year-old just upped and stopped arriving. School had only been open for a little over three months, and Justina was already absent 35% of the time. She attended PS94 and PS1 in Sunset Park. She was absent 51 days of kindergarten, 57 days of first grade, and 37 days of second grade. These schools had detailed attendance policies in place, but these school teachers, secretaries, and administrators either didn't know them or they ignored them, and both are unacceptable. Nobody ever noticed she wasn't showing up to school, and school officials never visited her home to check on her. Right after this, Denise Solero, Justina's mother, would withdraw Justina from PS1, letting the school know that they were moving and Justina could be placed in a new school. Justina's name should have remained on attendance rolls until the next school confirmed that she was enrolled, but this was never done. Therefore, she was left in limbo. There was nothing to alert school officials that she ever showed up at the next school. On November 30th, the city's Child Welfare Administration opened the case as they suspected that something was wrong. But still, nobody tried to track Justina down. 
It wasn't until December 5th of 1995 that the CWA sent the caseworker to the home of Justina to see what might be wrong. Upon arrival, the caseworker quickly accepted Solero's claims that Justina was in school at the moment. Quickly accepted, but never contacted the school to confirm this. This led to lots of bureaucratic shuffling and delayed everything by a month between December 5th of 1995 and January 5th of 1996. Justina's case finally getting some attention leads to questioning of the girl's whereabouts. But that same caseworker would accept Solero's new reason for Justina's absence. This time, she was on vacation with her father. By February 1st, the caseworker would recommend that Justina's case be closed. He recommended this without following CWA regulations that would require that at least two home visits be made before a case is closed. By mid-February of 1996, a supervisor approved the caseworker's request to close Justina's case, off the basis that the allegation of educational neglect was unfounded. At this point, excuses were coming from Solero left and right. So what was she hiding? In February of 1997, almost 14 months later, a new tip will lead investigators to an awful truth. On that day in 1997, a former boyfriend of Solero's walked into the 72nd precinct and told authorities that Justina was killed by her mother's live-in boyfriend, a man by the name Luis Santiago. Solero had, after 13 months, revealed the truth to her family and her ex-boyfriend. The Brooklyn man was arrested and a borough-wide search for the little girl's body was underway. When asked about Justina's whereabouts, Luis Santiago confessed to killing little Justina. Luis Santiago had moved into Justina and Denise Solero's home in August of 1995, and things quickly became a living hell for Justina. According to testimony given by Solero, Santiago was physically and verbally abusive toward her and her daughter, beating them with closed fists and belts. On one occasion, she found that Justina's lower body had been scalded as if burned. In another sickening account, she details how Santiago sexually assaulted Justina with a hammer right in front of her because he wanted to teach the child a lesson. On the night of December 30th, 1995, Santiago ordered Justina to sleep naked on the floor. Details of what happened to Justina seem to clash when the stories are told by Santiago and Solero. The details I'm about to describe are heartbreaking nonetheless. Santiago would say that on December 31st, he was in a fight with the child's mother when Justina got in the way, and as he struck her mother, he unintentionally killed her by striking her with his fists and a metal pole. But according to Solero, this played out a lot different than Santiago stated. According to Solero, Justina refused to take a bath and Santiago took it as a sign of disrespect. Eight-year-old Justina was dragged into the bathroom, then thrown headfirst into the bathtub. Santiago began to drown little Justina, but Justina fought and fought to keep her head above water, flaring her legs and arms, fighting for her life. When Santiago couldn't successfully drown the eight-year-old, he violently pulled her from the tub onto the floor and dragged her across the apartment to the bedroom. This is when Santiago beat her with his closed fists. He then took a metal pipe and began to beat Justina's body, face, and head with it. Justina still fought as she bled from her mouth and head until she finally passed out from the beating. Santiago grew frustrated that Justina still had a pulse and told Solero he couldn't take it anymore. Something needed to be done, and Solero agreed. Santiago ordered Solero to sit against the wall, and she put Justina down flat in front of her, with Justina's head wedged between her legs. Santiago began to duct tape Justina's head, wrapping the duct tape around at least three times, while her own mother forced her to stay still. She held her down by her legs and arms as Justina continued to try and break free. He covered her face and put his weight onto her, beginning to suffocate her. All the while the child's mother held her hands and stared into her eyes as she was being murdered. 
Justina's mouth partially covered with tape, and in a brief moment of being able to speak, uttered her last words, Mommy, make me pretty. Solero held her daughter's hand as she squeezed for dear life. Finally, after hours of torturous treatment from Santiago and Solero, her hand stopped squeezing back. Justina was gone and she could suffer no more. As if details of a mother helping her boyfriend murder her child aren't enough, the pair then went on to live life as if nothing ever happened. Once Justina was killed, they took her battered body, wrapped her up and put her in a shopping cart and left her in the closet. The two went to a New Year's Eve party after and acted as if nothing was wrong. After about a week of Justina's body being in the closet, she began to decompose. So they decided that this was a good time to get rid of her body. Santiago wrapped Justina's body up in more than 10 rolls of duct tape and several plastic bags to help conceal the smell and what was actually inside. The pair left their Halsey Street apartment, both pushing shopping carts. Santiago had a shopping cart filled with dirty laundry, while Solero pushed a shopping cart that held her daughter's remains. Solero went on to explain how the two of them walked for hours through the snow. When they finally came upon a cul-de-sac behind some homes near 6th Avenue and 17th Street, Santiago knew the area well since he went to junior high school nearby. They then reached a vacant lot in the 400 block of St. Mark's Avenue in Brooklyn where they left her. Santiago removed Justina's body from the cart and placed it in the snow. Once her body was disposed of, the pair walked to a laundromat on Union Street and began to do their dirty laundry. Once finished, they left the cart that Justina's body was previously in behind, and then they went home. Santiago returned to the location where they dumped Justina's body to see if she was still there, but she was gone. Unlike many other cases, the people who committed these atrocities weren't committing these with the help of alcohol or drugs. They carried out this crime sober and fully aware of their actions. Nothing a child could do could ever merit this type of treatment. Solero would tell authorities that she feared for her life and did what Santiago asked. She stated that he threatened her and the rest of her family with death if she ever told anyone what they did. So, you let her die, didn't you? Asked Prosecutor Barry Schreiber. Yes, I did answered Solero as she sat at the witness stand. Solero also went on to detail how Santiago began to use a pillow to smother her daughter. Did you push him off of her? No, I did what he told me to do. Solero, now their star witness, who successfully painted herself as a battered woman, received sympathy from the district attorney presiding over the case, Charles Hines. Solero willfully failed to report the murder because she wanted to protect Santiago. Solero pled guilty to hindering prosecution, yet she was able to cut a deal. She was offered just five years of probation for her involvement in Justina's death. She got this because she agreed to testify. But the real issue is, they didn't know about the extent of her involvement until after she cut the deal. Hines would say that this was absolutely necessary because although Santiago confessed to killing Justina, there was no body, and they needed eyewitness testimony. A little girl got in the way. A similar situation in the 1997 Justina Morales case. Justina's mom made a deal with Brooklyn prosecutors to testify against her boyfriend. The jury refused to convict for murder and chose manslaughter. I simply would not risk the possibility that no one would be found responsible. Members of the jury didn't buy Solero's version of the story. Since Santiago stated it was accidental, the second degree murder charges that were originally applied were dropped and changed to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 19 years in prison for the murder of Justina Morales. At one point, the jury was for an 11 to one all out acquittal of Santiago. As deliberations went on and sentencing was read, Santiago had a courtroom full of supporters family and friends who believed he did this only because of Solero's influence. They believed she was the true mastermind of the attack and that she should pay for her involvement. While they had a point, it did nothing to change that their relative was getting off easy. The monster still committed this crime, 
and you can't ever dismiss the other allegations. They fell in line with the personality of a man who confessed to what he did in detail. Not one person showed up in court to support Justina the day of sentencing. As of 2016, Luis Santiago is a free man, and Denise Solero never did any jail time. Solero played the system, and she won. Justina would have been 35 years old. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching today's video. I really appreciate all the love and support. Justina's case for me is really heartbreaking because I can't wrap my head around the fact that a girl could go missing for 14 months and nobody notices, nobody says a thing. You know, thank goodness for her aunt who was able to come forward and actually get some attention toward her case because of the fact that she noticed she wasn't going to school. A lot of these situations happen just because of the fact that people don't speak up when they notice these things. So to know that someone was behind her actually noticing and caring, that was nice, but you know, unfortunately it wasn't enough to save her. As you guys have noticed, I've been doing a lot of these short pieces recently. Again, this is just because of the fact that a lot of these cases don't have too much info out, and I still feel they deserve that attention. So I do my best to put these pieces out with as much information as possible. But as long as the information is limited, that's why the pieces are a little shorter. But of course, I will continue to do my more detailed full-length pieces, and I have a lot more coming your guys' way, so I hope you stick around. But now I'm gonna pass the question off to you guys. Who do you think was at fault for this other than the monsters who committed the atrocities? Would you blame the school system? Would you blame the Child Welfare Administration? Would you blame friends and neighbors who might have seen things and just never said anything? Please feel free to discuss in the comments below. Just keep in mind these are real cases tied to real people and they are still mourning. Now friends, always remember, keep a tight circle, mind your surroundings, because you never know who around you might have evil intentions. I'm out.